here at beautiful Brook Green Gardens located in the low country of South Carolina. Here we are a museum. A museum is a collection of things. We have sculpture, flora, and fauna. Flora and fauna are Latin words for animals and plants. Maybe you've heard the word floral or flower. Does it sound familiar? Here our founders took four abandoned rice plantations and turned it into the beautiful American sculpture garden that we are today. Do any of you collect things at home? Maybe seashells? Dolls? Rocks? Raise your hand if you do. These are our founders, Archer Milton Huntington and Anna Hyatt Huntington. Archer Huntington was a philanthropist. That means someone who helps others, sometimes by giving generous donations or money. This is Anna Huntington. She was a sculptor and she did this piece right here we call the Visionaries. Anna Hyatt Huntington had a love for animals and sculptures. She created this beautiful garden in the shape of a butterfly. Here you see a Scottish deer hound, which she depicts in several of her sculptures. She raised them. Thanks to this amazing couple, they opened Brook Green Gardens in 1932 to the public as the first American sculpture garden. And thanks to a generous donation from International Paper in Georgetown, South Carolina, we are going to be able to tour. Come with me and I'll show you to our first stop. Hey, here we are on our first stop in our tour of Brook Green Gardens. I'm outside in our plant nursery where we have lots of plants awaiting to go in the gardens. Plants are extremely important to life. They grow on mountains and valleys and deserts and in fresh and salt water. They're almost everywhere. Plants come in all shapes and sizes from the smallest seedling to the towering pines behind me. Not only are plants beautiful to look at, but they play a vital role in keeping people, animals, and the earth healthy. Plants provide food, medicine, shelter, and even the oxygen we need to breathe. Plants are living things. All living things need certain things to survive. Do you know what plants need to survive? I'll give you three seconds to decide. All plants need five things to survive. Place, like these containers, light, air, nutrients, water, and space. Not all plants need the same amount of each, so you have to do a little research and find out how much of each one you should give your plant. Not only so it can survive, but it can thrive. Here we have a flower and almond plant that loves the sun. That's why we keep it here in our sunny nursery. These are plants in our sunny nursery. These plants all need lots of sun to thrive. Not only do they need sun, but they also need soil or space. Plants need space to grow. These plants are placed in large pots and will be put directly into the ground or into bigger containers. Plants need space to grow, whether they're in our pots, in our greenhouse, out in the nursery, or in our gardens. Horticulturalists or gardeners make sure that they plant things with enough space to make them grow. If I was a tree, I wouldn't be able to grow. Oh, oh, can I do it? These plants also need nutrients. These plants have roots in the ground that will act as a straw to suck up the water and the nutrients that the plants need. Vicki, what are you doing out here in the nursery? Oh, I was checking this plant to make sure it was getting enough nutrients. Awesome. We were just talking about how nutrients get sucked up through the roots. Can you show us the roots on that plant? I sure can. Wow, I can see the roots all intertwined. Those guys are acting as straws to suck up nutrients for the plant. What kind of nutrients do that, does that plant need? This plant needs nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus to grow well. Wow, I heard some plants even need calcium too. That too. So Vicki, you said plants get nutrients from the soil? They use their roots as straws to suck up nutrients? Can I get calcium this way? No, silly. Oh. Eat some yogurt and cheese. Thanks, Vicki. Can I get potassium this way? No, go eat a banana. Oh. Vicki and I are taking a break from a long morning working in the gardens. Just like taking a break in the sun helps energize us, it also gives energy to plants. They usually get their energy from the sun 
but they can also get it from a light bulb. Uh, this is a process called photosynthesis. Photosynthesis helps plants make their food. Can you say photosynthesis? Photosynthesis. Now try it in a whisper. Photosynthesis. Great! Photosynthesis can be broken down into two words. Photo means light, synthesis means to make. So plants use photosynthesis to make their food. That's what the process is. Isn't that neat? Really cool. You know, I can make my own food too. I can make my own food, Vicki. Not like that, silly. <laughs> Here we have a pitcher plant. It's a very unique plant. It's called a carnivorous plant. Do you know what that word means? I'll give you three seconds. Carnivorous means to eat meat. So this plant will actually eat insects. Now why would a plant that can make its own food need to eat insects? You know, it's because it grows in poor nutrient soil. So it has to make up for that. And it eats insects. It traps them inside of its hood. And once they get in there, they can't get out. It's able to absorb the nutrients from that insect's body into the plant and actually grow bigger and stronger. Just like people, plants need air too. When we breathe in, we're taking in the oxygen that plants give. When we breathe out, we're giving the plant carbon dioxide. Thanks, buddy. You're welcome. Here we are inside our greenhouse where they ensure that all these plants get everything they need to survive. We give them plenty of space to grow. We also make sure that they get light from the sun. And then these fans keep the air circulating and moving inside. Outside, these plants would use the wind to keep the air moving. Plants need water to grow. Some plants need to be watered daily. Other plants can go long periods without water. Outside, plants get water from the rain. Inside, we use hoses to make sure that water can get adequately to each of our plants. All living things need water to live. Plants, animals, and even people. Vicki! Now that we have talked about all the things that plants need to survive, let's review. Plants need place, light, air, nutrients. They're thirsty for water and soil. Here we are in our greenhouse. We're going to talk with Vicki Richardson, and she's going to tell us about the journey of a seed, how it starts as a baby and makes its way to its full potential and growing into a full plant. Here she is now. Hi, Stephanie. We're going to show the kids today how to plant seeds. These are summer squash seeds. These are good vegetables that your parents and you might like to grow in your garden. But we're going to start them off in this propagation tray. You see, it's like a lot of little pots all in one tray. And the way we would plant in this tray is first of all, we'd take some nice soil, very fine soil so the little seeds can push up through it. And we smooth it down and fill the little pots with the soil. And then we can take the seeds which these aren't very small seeds, not as small as some can be, but they are kind of little. And you're just going to want to push them down into your pot, not too far, because you want it to be able to get up and get out of the soil towards the sunshine. So just push it down in there and plant your seeds. And we can do each little pot so that they've got space between them to grow and their roots are going to fill up the bottom of their little pot that they're growing in. Now you aren't going to have a tray like this at home, but you can use a lot of things that you would recycle that you have at home, like an egg carton. Just make sure you put a hole in the bottom for drainage, but you could use this in the same way and fill it up with soil and plant your seeds. You might use a little condiment cup. Uh, but just once again, make sure you put a hole in the bottom and you can put your soil in here and grow your seeds. This is a little 
fruit cup and it would be a perfect thing for seeds too and you could line these up on your windowsill just give it the drainage so that the water can get out after you plant your seeds in your tray they need to be watered in because of course water is very important for plants to grow Here we are in our next stop. This is one of my favorite gardens. This is the Thays Garden, and it's filled with lots of vegetables and fruits. Today we're gonna to talk about the parts of the plant, what an heirloom seed is, and how these beautiful plants grow. Do you know what an heirloom is? An heirloom is something that has been passed down from generation to generation. Maybe your grandparents had something very special that they saved, passed it down to your parents, and then when you get older, they'll pass it down to you. That's what we've done here in the garden. After one plant produces seeds, we save them for the next year's garden so that we can plant them again. Before we get started on talking about all the different vegetables that we have growing in here, let's learn a little bit about the part of the plant. Here we have a sweet pea. You may be thinking it's like the canned peas that you buy at the store, but this is actually used for its fragrance and can't be eaten. But just like a pea or another type of flowering plant, you have different parts. Here we have the stem. The stem is going to be what? The transportation method from the roots underground all the way up to the leaves. Now we talked about this a couple times. Do you remember what the leaves jobs are? They're like food factories. They're going to use the carbon dioxide that I'm putting out, the light energy and water to create sugar. That sugar is going to provide food for the plant. It goes from the leaves to the stem, down into the roots. If you look right here closely, you can see the purple flowers right here on the sweet pea ornamental plant. These flowers are going to attract insects to give nectar to. This is important in our garden because it attracts pollinators, which we need to create vegetables and fruits. Here we have one of the oldest vegetables dating back to the 1600s. Maybe you recognize it. This is the cabbage plant. Cabbage is a vegetable grown in many places around the world like China, India, and Russia. This leafy green vegetable is packed with vitamin C, vitamin K, and fiber. When we eat cabbage, we are eating the leaves of the plant. These leaves can be steamed, boiled, eaten raw, like in coleslaw. Raise your hand if you like cabbage. Another vegetable you may be familiar with is lettuce. Lettuce is filled with vitamin C, calcium, and fiber. Our horticulturalists have planted this vegetable in neat rows and make the garden look like a beautiful quilt. Lettuce is used in salads, often on top of burgers and tacos. Can you tell me what part of the plant we eat? If you said the leaf, then you are right. How do you like to eat lettuce? Here we have a carrot plant. It doesn't look like the baby carrots you may eat at home. The actual plant part that you see here is the stem and the leaves, and they can grow up to three feet tall. They're gonna grow bright white flowers. Watch this. The part of the carrot plant that we eat is actually the root. Carrots come in all different colors like purple and yellow, but bright orange is my favorite. The orange color is from the keratin, which gives the body vitamin A, and this is important for healthy skin, vision, and bone development. Here's another example of a root that can be eaten. This is the onion. I know this plant doesn't look like the onions that you buy at the store, but that's because the part that we eat grows underground. An onion is used in many cultures around the world. It is often used to season food. When it is cut, a chemical is released that will make you cry. Have you ever cut an onion? Don't be sad because onions are filled with vitamin C, calcium, and many other nutrients. Garden peas come in many different varieties, and most of them like to grow in cool weather, so it's best to plant them in spring or fall. English peas are harvested when they are young and tender. They are removed from their pod and cooked or eaten raw. Snap peas and snow peas make a great snack. 
Did you know you can eat the entire sweet and crunchy pod? It's edible. This is a blackberry bush. It produces juicy black or red purple fruits. A fruit is a part of a flowering plant that contains the seeds. Right now there are no berries growing, but as you can see it is starting to bloom these small white flowers. After the flowers are pollinated, they will turn into fruits. Apples, berries, and oranges contain many seeds. Other fruits like cherries and peaches only contain one seed or pit. Blackberries are a fairly good source of iron and vitamin C. They're eaten fresh in preserves, jams, or jellies, and often in baked goods like cobblers and pies. Next on our tour of beautiful Brook Green Gardens is our award-winning botanical gardens. There's lots of seeds, sprouts, and surprises awaiting us. So come with me to learn more about the plants, flowers, trees, and sculpture we have here. Here we have the beautiful foxgloves blooming around our sculpture, Laughing Boy and Goat. The foxglove flower can grow 18 to 60 inches tall. They have beautiful bell-shaped flowers that may be white, purple, or yellow. This flower is grown for medicinal purposes. The dried leaves are used to create a heart medicine, but don't eat the flower leaves because they are poisonous. They are native to Europe. That means you would not find them growing naturally in the wild here in Georgetown County, South Carolina. Looking straight ahead, you will see the beautiful sculpture, Diana. Brook Green Gardens was the first public sculpture garden in the United States. Our outdoor museum showcases a large collection of sculpture among plants and native animals. You will see a variety of flowers and plants that have been placed in this flower bed. There are foxgloves, mums, and snapdragons. The flower petals are all very different, different colors and shapes, but they are all used by the plant to attract different garden insects. The snapdragons rely on the bumblebee for cross-pollination. This is what ensures the plant will make more seeds to grow more plants next year. This is an azalea bush. It fills our garden with vibrant colors early spring here at Brook Green. You can see that there are multiple flowers growing together. There are some buds almost ready to bloom. Here we have a bright pink azalea that has attracted a bee. The bee moves in and out of the flowers, carrying pollen from one part of the flower called the anther to another part called the stigma. This will ensure that the plant can produce seeds to create more plants. The seed pods will become visible after the flowers drop, eventually turning dark brown, splitting open, and will drop the seeds right to the ground. You now see a flowering dogwood tree. This is a native deciduous tree. That means it loses its leaves each year. Next we have our bottle brush. This plant is native to Australia. It has bright bushy red stamens or flowers that resemble something used to clean a baby's bottle. It loves full sun and has a very fragrant smell. Isn't that a neat looking flower? Here is one of my favorites, a ground cover rose that grows close to the ground and spreads horizontally rather than growing tall. It has beautiful pink flowers that have a very nice smell, but I don't want to get too close. Roses have thorns to help protect themselves from predators. Now we're standing in Live Oak, LA. On each side of the path are live oak trees that are over 260 years old. These trees are native to the low country. They grow well by the ocean and have a great resistance to salt spray. The name live oak comes from the fact that they remain green throughout the winter and many other trees lose their leaves. Here you see the large trunk of the live oak tree. You can also see the long extensive branches that spread out the leaves to receive lots of sunlight. Trees need sun too. Growing on the tree, you will see two other plants. We have Spanish moss, which is an epiphyte. That means it's an air plant and does not require soil. We also see the green resurrection fern. This fern gets its name because it turns brown and looks dead during periods without rain, but it will turn green after. Here we are standing in our palmetto garden. It is filled with the South Carolina state tree, the cabbage palmetto. You may have seen it on the South Carolina state flag. The palmetto tree can grow about 80 feet tall. It has a narrow and water resistant trunk. These trees are found all along the coast and have excellent hurricane resistance. The tops are filled with fan shaped leaves called fronds. Have you seen these in your community? This is the crepe myrtle tree. It grows well in clay soil and can tolerate periods without water. It has a very smooth bark compared to many other trees. Each year its bark peels revealing a colorful smooth bark beneath. It loses its leaves each winter to save energy. Here's a nice garden surprise, a North American green snake. 
These snakes often make their homes in gardens. They are sometimes called the vine snake because they can camouflage or blend in to look like a vine. Snakes are similar to crepe myrtle trees in that they also shed each year as they grow. This is our last stop on our tour of Brook Green Gardens. I'm standing in our arboretum. Is that a new word for you? An arboretum is a collection of trees. In our arboretum, we have over 95 different species or types of trees here. Let's learn more about them together. Just like the plants you saw in our greenhouse, trees need a place, light, air, nutrients, water, and a space to grow. As we move through the arboretum, you will see a variety of different trees. Each of these trees may look very different, but serve an important role in our environment. Trees are our breathing partners. They give us oxygen and we give them carbon dioxide. Trees also help cool the earth. They give off moisture and more moisture in the air means more rain. All living things, plants, animals, and people need water to live. Trees are a renewable resource used to make many different things. We use trees to make houses, books, chocolate, and much more. They provide homes and food to animals. The trees you see here are homes to animals like the great horned owl, gray fox, squirrels, wood ducks, and many other birds, mammals, and insects. Fallen trees serve an important role in our forests. They provide homes to animals, but also as they die, they decompose or break down. This process gives nutrients back into the soil in the circle of life. Trees may look very different, but they have the same parts, and each of those parts have a special job to do in keeping the tree growing and healthy. Most trees have three main parts, the crown, the trunk, and roots. The crown is the branches and leaves of the tree. Just like in other plants, the leaves are tiny factories that make food for the tree. The leaves of a tree can look different. You are looking at a southern magnolia tree. It has dark green leaves. Branches are a transportation method for water and nutrients. They also store extra sugar for the tree. The trunk of the tree provides its shape and support and holds up the crown or the top of the tree. The trunk transports water and nutrients from the soil and sugar from the leaves. Now let's look at the bark of this tree. Roof. When my dog barks, she is protecting me. The bark of a tree protects it. It protects the tree from injury like fire and from insects. Just like you wear clothes to protect you, a tree wears its bark. Here we have a cypress tree. Most trees' roots grow underground and are not visible. They are like your feet. They hold you up. The roots also can extend deep and far to get water and nutrients for the tree. These roots are very visible because this tree grows in pluff mud, and these roots will help keep it from falling over. Trees are found all over the world and can be used in many different ways. Indigenous people use wooden tools to hunt for food and provide shelter for their families. The rubber for bicycle tires comes from the rubber tree. Cinnamon is the inner bark of the cinnamon tree. Ice cream, shampoo, and toothpaste all contain a wood fiber called cellulose. Trees and other plants make up forest. Forests are an important natural resource on Earth. A natural resource is something that is found in nature and can be used by people. Earth's natural resources include light, air, water, plants, animals, minerals, and fossil fuels. There is more to forests than just a bunch of trees. It's made up of a variety of trees and plants. Forests also include the soils that support the trees, the water bodies that run through them, and even the air around them. Forests come in many sizes and forms. They give home to many different animal species. We must help protect them. Ways that I help is by recycling and conserving paper. When you are at home or school, try and use both sides of the paper and recycle paper and plastics. International Paper funded this program and we are so grateful to them. International Paper is committed to making quality products ensuring responsible use of the forests that supply our wood. This way of using a forest is known as sustainable forestry. In sustainable forestry, efforts are made by replacing almost all the resources that we get from the forest by taking extra care to ensure that there is very little damage to the wildlife and natural environment. Good forestry programs also make it possible for humans to get some economic value without hurting the forest in any way.